Hello, I'm B.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with two-term Bernalillo County clerk, Mary Toulouse Oliver, who is running this November for the Office of Secretary of State of our state of New Mexico. This is a vital office that has a kind of a controlling force, if you will, in voting rights issues in New Mexico. And in a time of rampant voting rights suppression, it's particularly important. Uh, Maggie has already duked it out uh, with conservative tricksters at the polls here in 2012. And uh, she really does believe, I believe, in transparency and in honest government. Uh, it's very good to have you here with us today and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be here. So. Many people, I think, uh, are sort of confused about what might be called the lesser offices in state government, like the state auditor and uh, the secretary of state, although, of course, they're not lesser at all. But uh, I don't really think uh, our, our civics uh, education is all that hot anymore in the whole country. So c could you explain to our, to our viewers and our readers what the secretary of state actually does in New Mexico? Sure. Well, the Secretary of State is the chief elections official for the entire state of New Mexico. And as you probably know, county clerks actually run and manage the elections at the county level. But the Secretary of State is responsible for an umbrella role in terms of ensuring that state law is implemented properly. There are a lot of aspects of the election code that the Secretary of State is charged personally with implementing. So making rules and procedures, et cetera, um, so that county clerks can follow those when they do conduct elections. Uh, the Secretary of State is responsible for ensuring that our statewide voter registration system is maintained um, and that rules and regulations, training, et cetera, are put into place for county clerks to be able to utilize that system. Um, the Secretary of State has a very overarching policy responsibility with regard to the oversight and conduct of elections. Um, and so the Secretary of State also has a responsibility around enforcement of the, uh, the campaign finance laws in the uh, state. So there's a whole ethics division oh, wow. um, pertaining to campaign finance contributions and lobbying um, aspects of, you know, people registering to lobby and the activities that they conduct that the Secretary of State oversees as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, the new role that the Secretary of State just undertook was the Business Services Division or the corporate filings. So now when a business is created in New Mexico, they file that paperwork with the Secretary of State's office, oh. much like we do in other states. So you've been the clerk of Bernalillo County since 2007. What has caused you to, uh, to consider the statewide run? What, uh, what's happened to, um, to that office in the last four years, let's say? Well, that's a very good question. You know, when I when I came into office seven years ago, I was just strictly interested in fixing the problems that I saw in the Bernalillo County Clerk's Office. You know, we had had some some elections, um, even national elections, where where the uh, the microscope was placed on our county. Um, we had a lot of problems in implementing elections here in Bernalillo mm -hmm. County, let's just say. And so when I came in, my, my great focus was to do one main thing, and that was to smoothly and effectively implement the election process and to follow the law. And we, we got that in place, I think, pretty quickly and pretty well. And in the 2008 election, which was frankly um, the highest turnout election we'd ever experienced in New I Mexico that, history, yeah. we had a very smooth election process here in Bernalillo County. And so then I looked at ways of how we could improve the process. And so I worked together with my fellow county clerks to do things like expanding early voting and then we uh, we were able to successfully pass a vote center law so that people can vote at any vote center on election day they're not tied to their home precinct I've been bringing technology um, and tools into the county clerk's office and doing a lot of voter education so that voters know about their voting options and things like that so um, those are the things I've done here and of, of course I'm very passionate about the election process I'm very passionate about fair transparent elections and I'm very passionate about voter participation and the reason I'm running is because if you would have asked me four years ago are you gonna run for Secretary of State I would have said well I think I think we just elected a Secretary of State who um, is gonna be fair competent and nonpartisan. Um, I don't think she's been fair and I don't think she's been nonpartisan and I think that her interest is in um, 
making policies that benefit one party over the other and making these crucial decisions like in the ethics division around campaign finance laws that are partisan motivated decisions. And I think that our election officials have to be have to be fair and nonpartisan. And uh, we have to ensure that our elections are run fairly because really, I mean, the election is the cornerstone of our democracy. We have to be able to believe that the outcome of the election um, is is how we all cast our ballot. And so I believe very strongly about that. And that's why I'm running. So could you tell our audience sort of what your uh, uh, view of, of, of the current office holders actions are and what what has she actually done in a partisan way, uh, for instance? And could you also talk a little bit about the background and the perspective of uh, the of her uh, elections chief, Arata Dare? So, so to speak uh, very, very generally, um, the current Secretary of State. Um, seems to be practicing a political point of view um, that that is, that is common among her party nationally, and that is to make decisions that negatively impact voter participation. Um, the reason why uh, the current secretary and that party is interested in negatively impacting voter participation is because they believe that it will benefit their party. And so this the specific policies that we've seen or or even more even less specifically the general attitude has been uh, less of encouraging participation, fostering participation. What can we do to educate voters? What can we do to make sure that voters have access to the ballot? What can we do to be registering voters? What can we be doing to ensure that voters are able to cast that ballot and that ballot is counted accurately. The, instead, the policies have been geared toward how can we make it harder for people to vote? So, for example, um, they they got rid of the straight party ticket. Um, a, a lot of people would say, well, you know, the straight party ticket is, you know, it's it's an insult and it's for, you know, it's for people who, you know, don't really care about the election. That's not actually true. The, the straight party ticket is a tool utilized by members of both parties um, in order to help them. You know, the, the paper ballot is a, a long process to fill out. And so if, if you don't want to develop carpal tunnel in the process... <laughs> <laughs> then, then for some people, um, they they utilize the straight party ticket, and maybe they cross over vote on on one election or the other. Um, but they say, well, I'm mostly going to vote for the Republican Party, so I'll, I'll choose that. So that that's one decision she made. Um, she. She um, did not make sure that we had adequate enough voter registration forms in our offices in the 2012 election. This is a general election. It was the summer, a lot of voter registration activities going on, and we ran out, even though we had requested those forms. Um, she's been pursuing policies um, such as strict photo voter ID, um, removing people from the rolls, alleging that people are on the rolls that are non-citizens or shouldn't be eligible to vote. Um, she's, she's basically cast a lot of aspersions on the election process. And that type of, of behavior is um, depressing to voters, and it makes them feel um, like the, the process is, is problematic and that, that you know, their participation in it is, um, is not worthwhile. And so um, it's, it's that general um, philosophy of how can we make it harder to vote, um, which is where I, I take sub substantive issue with the current Secretary of State. In terms of her um, her, her policy chief, Rod Adair, or, or whatever his title is, um, it, seems to, it seems to change depending on who you ask. Um, <laughs> as you probably know, Mr. Adair was a, a state senator in New Mexico for a long time from Roswell. Uh, very conservative, which is, is neither here nor there as far as I'm concerned, because it takes all kinds yeah. uh, to run government in New Mexico and in this country. But when he left, um, he, you know, he was very highly partisan and very divisive. Of senator, and when he left office, he said, "quote that he was leaving the Senate because he felt he could make more of a difference for the Republican Party from the outside of the Senate." And the next place he landed was the Secretary of State's office mm -hmm. that is charged with fairly and impartially running elections, right. and that for me is a huge problem. So we know that um, that the current uh, mayor of Albuquerque uh, uh, ran an initiative to uh, to have voters have to have IDs at the polls. Uh, you mustn't have liked that very much. Uh, what uh, is there any way to undo that? So, actually, and I don't mean to be contrary, but that that Albuquerque voter ID law actually came into effect under the previous administration, oh, okay, but good, but good. it has been carried forward. Yeah. Um, there there are a variety of of physical IDs um, that can be produced, but it does require a photo ID in Albuquerque. Um, I have actually seen photo ID, and I think what the research shows is that. Um, 
that nationally and in places where it's required, what's happening is is that it depresses voter turnout again. It, it discourages participation. Um, the youth, elderly, uh, people who live in rural areas, people who have transportation issues, they all find it difficult um, to obtain the exact kind of ID that's necessary in order to cast a ballot. And the interesting thing is that we don't really see, research is showing us um, that we don't really see actual cases of in-person voter fraud that are occurring. In fact, the current Secretary of State herself uh, wrote a report to the state legislature in 2011 that only produced a handful of, of voter fraud cases that had been prosecuted in New Mexico over over the last couple of decades, and those were principally voter um, absentee voter uh, voting issues. Um, and so in-person voter fraud just doesn't seem to be occurring. What we do know is that people who are required to have IDs um, in, in some cases cannot get the IDs that they need. And you see the things that have happened in Texas where, you know, the name has to be the same. And so married women are having issues casting a ballot. Um, we just see more problems being created with photo voter ID laws than an actual problem being solved. And I think the Secretary of State's role um, and election administrators' roles in general should again, be to foster and encourage voter participation and help try to ensure that every voter can vote and every vote can be counted accurately. So I remember in, in 2012, uh, we had some instances in Bernalillo County of what I think uh, came to be called uh, vigilante poll um, watchers who were actually instructing people uh, that, uh, that they didn't have a right to vote or telling them grossly erroneous uh, of things. Could you, could you tell us about that a little bit more and, and what you did to put it into it? Well, having watchers and observers at the polls here in New Mexico is a longstanding tradition. Both political parties and outside parties, such as academics, have, have partaken in, in that activity. I, I think it brings a real transparency to the election process. It ensures that um, that the, the poll workers are, are following the rules. And if there's if there are questions that come up during the process, if, if issues arise, um, poll, poll watchers can help us address those. What, what happened, however, in 2012 was that there was a group um, that was being trained and and it, it came to, to light that this training was occurring at the Republican Party headquarters, um, which I, I didn't even know at first. Um, but basically, there was a manual that was brought to my attention from this poll worker training that um, suggested that poll workers or, or poll watchers had a right to challenge voters um, based on not having certain types of identification, um, that they had the right to correct the behavior of, of poll officials, um, that they were able to intercede in certain transactions between the voter and the poll workers. And when I read this, yeah, it, it, ap it absolutely shocked me because none of those things are true. Um, a poll watcher or observer has a right to, of course, be present, has a right to make notes, um, has a right to, you know, step out and make a phone call if they need to and bring things, and they can ask questions of the, of the poll worker, bring things to their attention. Um, but they absolutely cannot intervene in an election process. Um, and challenges can only occur in a very narrow situation. And, and frankly, that situation situation is that the voter is not registered to vote. That That is when a challenge can be imposed. And in today's day and age, we have provisional ballots um, to address those types of situations. So really, um, you know, what I saw was pretty outrageous to me. And so um, I did, uh, you know, call some attention to the matter. And I do believe that there was some effort made to remediate, uh, retrain and things like that. And I will say um, that I did not see any issues of um, challengers or watchers acting out of hand or behaving in an illegal manner in the election in 2012. But frankly, I think that's only because those issues were brought to light beforehand and we were able to um, make it known that, you know, we were not going to tolerate that type of behavior in, in, the, um, in the polling places in Bernalillo County. So, you know, I've, I've been writing about, about voting rights for a very long time, and I'm passionate about it, too. And I know that, uh, you know, that it's really the kind of, uh, it's almost an ideal circumstance to mess up because everybody's tired and it's a long process and everybody's all ramped up to get involved in this. And then you can just do all kinds of silly things and <laughs> cause all sorts of awful and it's very serious problems. So I'm wondering if, from your perspective as uh, the Burlington County Clerk, if you hear among amongst your peers of, of a lot of that kind of thing happening in New Mexico and whereabouts in New Mexico would it be the, the most egregious? Well, you know, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that point up. You know, elections are a very 
human process. Um, you know, I'm a human. Everyone that works for me are humans. The voters are humans. Um, it, it, and, and elections are so complicated. And you're right. They, they're so important to everyone. I mean, I, I don't think that a person of my opposing political ideology cares less about the election process than I do. In fact, I know we all care about it deeply and, and we all want a fair outcome, or at least I believe we all want a fair outcome at the end of the day. Um, but you're right. What ends up happening is in, in the, the heightened passion, um, and I do believe that sometimes due to miscommunication or lack of communication or wrong information, um, trust is often, uh, it, it becomes an issue. And so people um, feel the need to sort of take sides, armor up, you know, go to the polls, and, and they're sort of looking for, you know, voter fraud around every corner, or they're looking for a poll worker to, to be doing things, you know, illegally around every corner. And I don't think that those types of attitudes going into the process behoove either, us, either of us. But I will tell you a couple things that I know of that happened around the state um, two years ago. Um, certainly these these same um, individuals that were involved in, in the so-called vigilante poll worker training, they were also active in Rio Rancho. Um, and uh, we also saw things like, for example, in Chaparral, New Mexico, um, when, when we had an overwhelmed polling place um, in oh. on the Otero County side of Chaparral. Um, we had a lot of individuals that were down there trying to help facilitate the process as volunteers and uh, providing people with um, Spanish language information, providing them with water. There were some long lines um, that resulted and we had a sheriff's department brought in to do so-called crowd control and what ended up happening was um, we had you know big sheriff's cruisers lined up around the polling place. Crime scene tape was brought mm. out and so, you know, so this looks differently, you know, this, this looks differently depending on where you are, you know, it could be, you know, in Albuquerque, it could just be a poll watcher, you know, making it hard for people to vote in Chaparral, it could be um, just the, the mere fact of sheriff's deputies um, standing around a polling place that yeah. could be hugely intimidating. We need to be so careful. I mean, I think that as election officials, we try really hard to be inclusive and make sure that that everyone can participate in the process. But we really need to make sure that people are behaving in accordance with the law and and voters are not being intimidated in that process. Going to the polls for people of my generation is almost a sacred act. We look forward to it. We wouldn't if there's any chance in the world we wouldn't miss doing it. We don't like a lot of change, however. <laughs> we like to have the same thing happen for, you know, all of the decades that I've been alive well, for seven decades. I don't want to mess around. I want to go to the same places I've always gone. I want to concentrate on the issues of the day, not on the location and the geography and the process of voting. So I get really worked up when I hear about things like the Koch brothers trying to literally con people out of their view that they have a right to even vote at all. And this happened in West Virginia. And I know you've had some, some very strong opinions about this, but I have too. I, it just really rankles me. Anybody who messes around with this process, who makes it any more difficult than it already is, and it shouldn't be difficult at all, but just because of numbers alone, it is. So could you explain a little bit about what happened in West Virginia and why we must be very, very vigilant uh, so it won't happen here this this kind of thing? Well, what happened recently was sort of a, a classic, uh, you know, uh, I hate to even say that, but, but we've seen it happen so many times. Uh, I can refer to it as sort of a classic tactic um, by folks who are interested in discouraging people to vote. And, and what happened was that there was a mailer that was sent out um, that basically made it seem as though voters, if they wanted to participate in the upcoming primary election, uh, were not going to be able to participate unless they, they jumped through some hoops and they you know did some voter registration updating. They had to call their county clerk's office. They had to do this, that, or the other thing. And, and we've seen... The same type of tactic happen. Um, it's it's the classic, uh, you know. Remember to vote on Wednesday. Um, yes. You know, right. mailer that you know that we've heard of also as well. You know, being sent out and you know primarily minority communities or things like that. Well, election um, day is Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So so basically, what happened was that a mailer went out that um, while while not over. Let's see. While not technically incorrect, 
was worded um, so that voters basically felt like they were they would have to um, that they would not be able to participate unless they had you know re-upped in their voter registration, which was not the case. Um, and so the 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 very wise Secretary of State in West Virginia, Natalie Tennant, um, you know, made sure that she made people aware of this fact. You know, if you got this thing in the mail, tear it up. It didn't come from my office. It's not an official piece of mail. Um, and and you know, I I think that. Um, Again, it goes back to what I was saying before about misinformation. You know, I, I think that, that sometimes people are well-intended and, and, and communicate misinformation, and that's a big enough problem to yeah, try to yeah, fix. Yeah. But when, when these types of things are done intentionally and purposefully um, to make people think that uh, they cannot participate, I mean, again, we, you know, we have, um, we have enough challenges, as you say, getting people to the polls, making sure that people participate in our democracy, um, which was designed to be a system in which we had wide participation from all walks of life, or else we would only end up with people being elected who looked like a handful of people in the population. Of course we want widespread population. Of course we want our representatives to look like we do as a people. But if we do things like this that are deliberately discouraging and that deliberately cause people to think that they can't participate, then we are uh, going to end up with, with less people participating in the process. And, and that is, you're right, that is just wrong. You know, I think really over the years, I can't think of really anything. Well, I guess that's not true, but, but uh, very few things that make me as angry as the thought of somebody trying to take someone's franchise away from them. It's as if they're running an Internet scam to get all their information. I mean, it's the same process. You're lying, you're, you're, you're conniving, you're tricking. You know, uh, in order to have, I mean, you're really a con artist. You're committing a... One who does that is committing a crime, in my judgment. Anyway, so um, a recent recent rulings in Wisconsin, I believe, in Ohio, uh, by uh, federal appeals courts, have overturned some of, some of uh, their voting rights uh, suppression acts. And I'm wondering if if that's a good sign in your judgment, and if uh, if perhaps that's going to set something up for mm -hmm. for the future that uh, a secretary of state might be able to use uh, uh, should this kind of stuff happen here more than it already does. Well, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting over the last decade or so um, that I've been really active on voting rights issues even before I became county clerk. We've certainly seen a push, a very strong push to try to restrict voting rights. And it's, it's exactly as you say. I mean, it, it is a deliberate intent to take people's franchise away. And when you think about everything that, you know, women did for literally oh. centuries to gain the right to vote here. Yeah. And then to think what, you know, African Americans went through and what Native Americans went through to, to gain the true right to vote without it being infringed upon um, in any sort of way. It, it really is sickening to think that there are these, um, these, these sort of more mild seeming, you know, tactics, you know, and again, I count photo voter ID among those. Photo voter ID does not solve a real problem. It's real intent is to prevent people who uh, who do not have the appropriate documentation from casting a ballot or to, or to make their lives, you know, kind of difficult in terms of getting to that ballot. So I think that the decision in Wisconsin in particular which basically said, look, you know, the, the what the appeals court in Wisconsin said was, look, this is not solving a problem in reality. You you have not been able to prove to me that there is any systematic frequent or hardly any at all in-person voter fraud actually occurring. So this photo voter ID law is, is not actually solving a problem. But what again, what we do know is around 10 to 12 percent of the population don't have the appropriate ID. So we do know that those people's right to vote is being taken away from them. Um, in Ohio, with the the early voting laws, I mean, again, I, I I can't even tell you to be honest with you what the rationale is for rolling back early voting. I I, I think you know a lot of people say, well, you know, um, you know, people might vote too early, and then and then information might come out about the candidate that they that they learn about later that um, changes their mind. But I think we know enough about. The behavior of voters that you know if, if a voter has their mind made up a month before the election almost you know 100 percent of the time it's going to be the same person they'd vote for on election day the only difference is they had an opportunity to vote at an earlier time that was convenient for them they didn't miss their opportunity to vote when they went and voted early so yes i am really encouraged by these decisions i think you know in new mexico i think the laws we have on the books right now are really good with yeah. regard to early voting and voter id and i think we either need to maintain the them in their current form, or even expand early voting potentially, and I'd like to see um, some some mobile early voting, some more rural.
rural early voting happening and things like that. You know, this thing about documentation, as we all know, it doesn't mean that you don't have documentation. If anybody, say, for instance, happens to put together enough money in their life to have to get a passport, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they know how difficult it is to find their birth certificate for heaven's sake. And if they can't find it, they have to go back to the county of, of their birth and they have to pay, borrow and steal and pay money in order to get it. I mean, it is a classic thing mm -hmm. to, uh, I mean, well, that word's being used not too often. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but, but it is so irritating because it doesn't mean anything. It just means that you don't have the paperwork. I mean, it's like the Nazis, you know, right. got to have the documents, you know. Well, if, anyway, so. I'm wandering on here, but, That's okay. but but let me ask you: um, if you um, uh, what what would be? And I kind of think about this stuff, trying to trying to trying to prepare myself uh, uh, to think about uh, the bad things that could happen. What what could what could actually happen if voter suppression, if these tools, these tricks, became a standard? I mean, is that ever, is that even a possibility that, that these things could become so entrenched, uh, particularly now with the McCutcheon stuff and other things, uh, uh, with, with all, all the money going one way? Or is there, are we in danger of that, or, or am I just being paranoid? Well, look, I, you know, I don't want to sound alarmist, and I'm sure you don't either, no, I don't. but I think the reality is that um, our our system of government, our, our democratic system, has, has drifted further and further away from, I think, the, the original intent of the founders. And, and I, you know, hate to get my, on my soapbox about the founders, but, um, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that, um, you know, they didn't all agree on on whether our, our d democratic system should be widely participated in or not. And I think what we're seeing today is, is sort of the modern uh, battle that you know, frankly, was going on when our when our forefathers were starting this country. You know, do we want to have a small, you know, learned group of men, uh, you know, making our decisions for all the masses, or or do we want to throw it open to the you know the passions and whims of the of the masses? Well, you know, I think I think what we've what we've learned over the years is every time more people are brought into the process, our democracy just becomes healthier and healthier. And so, yes, to your question, I think that I think it is a legitimate concern. I I think decisions like McCutcheon that that throw open the floodgates for for all of this, you know, dark money. You don't know who it's coming from. You don't know, uh, you know, who, you know what the source was, what it's being spent for. I mean, basically, anymore as citizens, you know, we we are being left. I, I use that that phrase, dark money. A lot of people use it, but it means we are being left in the dark as citizens. Yeah. We don't know who gave the money, we don't know why it was being given, we don't know what the purpose of it is. And so, you know, all we do is we see an ad, a, a really nasty TV ad on TV that, that makes disparaging remarks about an individual. That type of behavior depresses turnout. The, the rules that are being made that you're talking about depresses voter turnout. Basically, people are, are, are feeling less and less like they could and should participate um, because of, of all of these uh, rules that are being made to make it harder and more difficult for voters to participate. And again, that's why I'm so passionate on the issue of voter participation, why I think it's my job as a county clerk and the Secretary of State's job to make sure that voters have more opportunity to cast a ballot, that it's easier for them to vote, and that we aren't creating arbitrary rules um, that don't don't address real problems, but instead do make it harder for people to vote. So it seems if, as if uh, you don't want to have early voting because um, because uh, the candidate might say something naughty or uh, later on, or or you haven't had enough time to to uh, gin up your B PR campaign to ruin their <laughs> reputations. Uh, anyway, but so yeah. <clears throat> what? Uh, what what is it possible to do with this office? What would you like to see ha happen with the Secretary of State, uh, particularly if you have you know eight years, let's say, to do it? Well, there's a lot I'd like to do, and and you know I I can get into a lot of of specifics, which I'm which I'm happy to do. But I think um, the main the main focus that you'll see for me um, will be in terms of. A, protecting people's right to vote. Um, I'm going to have to reverse some of the decisions that the current Secretary of State made, um, particularly with the straight party ticket, because again, I think I think it um, uh, makes it easier for people to vote when they have that ability to, to, to check a box. Um, I'm going to be um, focused on 
again, you know, expanding early voting. Um, I would like to see uh, more rural early voting. I'd like to see some mobile early voting. I would like county clerks to have a lot more technology available to them than they currently have, um, which would make that type of, of greater access feasible all around the state. Um, we need to continue modernizing our election system. We've had a very antiquated system here in New Mexico. We need to uh, vastly improve our voter registration database. Um, a lot of our records are extremely outdated. And I think for that reason, um, this the specter of voter fraud gets raised. What really needs to happen is we need to be a lot more sophisticated about how we update our data, how we how we match it against other state uh, databases and databases in other states. Um, we can be sharing that information. It can, I mean, most people assume when they move to you know Texas that their voter registration here is canceled and and their voter registration there begins. But that that doesn't happen because states aren't necessarily talking to each other. But we can in initiate those types of technological activities um, quite easily. We, you know, we built the nuclear bomb here in New Mexico. I have no doubt we can make some, some databases talk to each other. Um, and, and I really feel strongly about um, actually um, working very closely with the county clerks to help develop, to develop tools, to develop training for them. A lot of the issues that we have in elections in our state come from the fact that elections are under-resourced. They're under-resourced at the state level. They're under-resourced at the county level. And I'm not saying we have to throw money at problems because if you look at the work that I've done in Bernalillo County, we've completely modernized our election process, but we're saving a million dollars a year while we're doing it. Mm. Um, but sometimes you need some funding and you need some tools and resources in place and even just some basic training to be able to bring these systems forward into the 21st century. And so that's the type of work that I would like to do and I would like to partner with county clerks in order to do that. I feel like the set the last seven years um, I've been doing that type of work already, building those relationships. I'd like to continue on that. Um, and so again, you know, modernizing our system, um, expanding access and, uh, you know, just making sure that the the the, the partisan um, you know rigged piece of things that I feel like is going on in the Secretary of State's office is done away with because really we need an uh, election official that that again um, is is behaving in a fair and and nonpartisan and transparent way and and that's really important to me. So your office is obviously funded by the legis legis legislature like everybody else is. Mm -hmm. How, uh, do you have enough, enough friends, I don't mean you, but does the office have enough friends in the legislature to, to actually make an impact to get some more money to do these, these kind of things? And who, who might they be? Well, I, the truth is I do personally have enough friends, if you want to call them. I mean, I've been lobbying for election issues in the state legislature for 10 years now. The last right. seven of them as county clerk. I have built those relationships. And I do think that um, the legislators have come to know me as an expert on elections. And I think they've come to trust and value my opinion. And and um, I certainly hope that I can continue to earn that trust and support from the legislature. Um I, I think two things. I think it's not necessarily about getting more funding. Um, you know, the Secretary of State's budget has actually increased 25% um, during Diana Duran's uh, tenure in office. And that's a little secret that not a whole lot of people know. And I don't necessarily think that it's a bad thing yeah. that the budget has increased, but I think you need to look at what those priorities are. So at the same time as the budget has increased, we've seen things go away. We've seen a, a, a mailing to all voters statewide go away. We've seen um, a non Navajo uh, Nation Outreach Coordinator go entirely away. We've seen positions stay vacant, um, supposedly necessary positions in the Bureau of Elections and the Ethics Division. Um, those have remained vacant so that uh, high-level administrators can be given salaries. And so I don't necessarily think it's even a an issue of uh, getting more money from the state legislature, although that, that may be necessary at some point. What I think it's an issue of is what is the office's priorities? Where is that funding going to? Where are we direct? Are we directing our funding toward the counties to give them the, the, the tools and resources that they need to conduct elections? Are we directing the money outward to educate voters and to make sure that they have the tools they need to cast their ballots? Are we directing the money at getting people registered to vote and, and getting them to the polling places? Or are we directing money at other things um, that aren't serving those purposes. And I think with me in office, you'll see a person who has the priority of making sure that the resources are going to to those priorities that I spoke of, the clerks and the voters, um, and making sure that um, we're, we're putting them first. 
Well, thank you so so very, very much. I've learned a tremendous amount. It's been really energizing to hear you talk. You really, you really got the juices going, and I, <laughs> I, I sure wish you well. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been my pleasure to be here and talk with you today.